Good afternoon, everyone. And in another moment, we're going to go ahead and get started. <laughs> People should still feel free, though, feel free to get um, drinks and snacks in the back as we start to get started. And can people hear me in the back? Excellent. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michelle Tracy Berger, and I'm the director of the Baker Nord Center for the Humanities, and I'm so delighted to welcome you to this event. For those who are new to the BNC, it's really important to say that we believe that we are the intellectual and social hub for amplifying the arts and humanities at Case Western. Our mission is to support the arts and humanities through fellowships, grants, symposia, and public-facing programming. We also, in conjunction with our many community partners, direct and organize the Cleveland Humanities Festival that our event today is a part of. This is the ninth year of the Cleveland Humanities Festival. It is always themed, and this year's theme is awe. I'll say that again, awe. Wonder, reverence, humility, intensity, fear. Awe is a complex emotional and cognitive state that can be triggered by a variety of experiences. Awe marks our lives in personal and public ways. Through the various performances, workshops, and events, the goal of the Cleveland Humanities Festival is always to inspire new questions and ignite a spirit of curiosity. I wanna take a moment now and thank our community partners on this event, including the Kelvin Smith Library and specifically William Claspey and also the Cuyahoga Arts and Culture and their project grant. The Cleveland Humanities Festival starts now and runs through May 1st or middle of May. So I wanna invite you to join our mailing list if you're not on, already on it. We have a handy QR code in the back of the room and also you'll see some of these handy um, advertisements. You can always, of course, visit us online at bakernord.case.edu. Now, I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Aviva Rothman. Aviva Rothman is the inaugural Dean's Associate Professor of History at CWRU. She is the historian of science whose work focuses on the early modern period and is the author of The Pursuit of Harmony, Kepler on Cosmos, Confession and Community, published by the University of Chicago Press, and The Dawn of Modern Cosmology, Copernicus to Newton, published just last year by Penguin Random House. After her talk, we'll have some time for questions. You are invited to the reception in the back and also to check out an exhibit of rare books from the KSL Special Collections. We're really excited to kick off the Cleveland Humanities Festival themed awe with Dr. Aviva Rothman. Please help me welcome her. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you to all of you for being here. Um, I want to start by uh, thanking Michelle and Maggie for setting this up, for, uh, thanking Bill for uh, working with me to put this together. I hope you guys all stay and look at the amazing books we have back there, some of which will feature in my talk today. So in keeping with the Cleveland Humanities Festival theme of awe, I want to open with this poem. Let me make sure this works. Ah, here we go. Uh, by Rebecca Elson, 2001. So here's what she says. We astronomers are nomads, merchants, circus people, all the earth our tent. We are industrious, we breed enthusiasms, honor our responsibility to awe. So she links astronomy to awe, and in doing this, she reaches back to a long historical tradition. If you go back to Plato and Aristotle, both of them linked philosophy itself to awe or wonder and argued that in fact philosophy begins with wonder, that it's the root, the first principle of philosophy, the moment where knowledge of self and the world begins. But if you think about what Aristotle actually meant when he said this, you find that he refers to a very particular kind of awe. So let me show you what he says. 
He says, every realm of nature is wonderful. Absence of haphazard and conduciveness of everything to an end are to be found in nature's works to the highest degree. And the end for which those works are put together and produced is a form of the beautiful. So if you look at what he's saying, what he's actually saying is that nature is awesome. It's wonderful because of its very regularity. It's because of things that don't change that we're awed by nature. And astronomy is sort of the preeminent example of this in the ancient world. So I want to pull up for you an image that you can see back there also. This is from the Nuremberg Chronicle. But this is a representation of the Aristotelian cosmos. And the difference that's being stressed here in this picture is between the earthly realm in the middle, Terra, which is the realm of change, of growth, of decay, of corruption and generation, and the heavenly realm, which is the precise opposite. It's the place where things move in perfect, unchanging circles eternally. Everything is always the same. That's what made it wonderful for Aristotle. Now, of course, there are celestial events that are not perfect and regular and unchanging that are in fact atypical, unexpected, irregular, rare. Some of those could be regularized. So eclipses, of course, were events where astronomers worked to fit them to regular cycles and patterns that could be predicted in advance for the f and for the future. Uh, others, like comets, were a bit harder to integrate into these cyclical, periodic understandings of nature, which is why Aristotle actually said that comets weren't celestial entities at all. Uh, from his perspective, they were terrestrial phenomena. They were um, something that happened in the Earth's atmosphere. They only seemed to exist in the heavens. But regardless of whether they could be made to seem periodic and regular or whether they could not, both eclipses and comets uh, still inspired feelings of terror and wonder, right? Awe in both its senses. They were typically seen as portents of things to come, either of war and famine and disaster on the one hand, or of uh, human flourishing and good fortune on the other. They could go both ways. Um, and they were often depicted in uh, visual images of the period. So let me just show you a few examples. Um, on the upper left, this is uh, from a very popular astronomy textbook written in the Middle Ages and published continuously since. So this is a printed version of it that shows both lunar and solar eclipses. Um, at the bottom on the, on I guess your left, um, that's another page from the Nuremberg Chronicle, which we have back there where you can see a comet depicted on the left, on the bottom left. Uh, the middle one here is an image from the bio tapestry. Um, and on the left, people are pointing up at a comet that would come to be known in later years as Halley's Comet. Um, and then on the right, this is a medieval manuscript depicting Alexander the Great consulting his astrologers after a total solar eclipse. So these are things that people uh, would frequently depict visually, often um, pretty exciting descriptions accompanied these uh, visual images. So I'll just give you um, one later example from the early 16th century. This is from a book on the Great Comet of 1528 by Ambrose Paré. Um, and he writes, this comet was so horrible, so frightful, and it produced such great terror in the vulgar that some died of fear, others fell sick. It appeared to be of excessive length and was the color of blood. At the summit of it was seen the figure of a bent arm, holding in its hand a great sword as if about to strike. At the end of the point, there were three stars. On both sides of the rays of this comet were seen a great number of axes, knives, blood-colored swords, among which were a great number of hideous human faces with beards and bristling hair. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see the picture that he's drawn of this comet on the side over here. So on the one hand, I want to say it's clear that comets have this sense of doom and dread that accompany them. On the other, I should note that there is no other report of a comet in 1528 aside from this one, and that what we think is that Paré was likely looking at a pretty spectacular display of the Aurora Borealis that he mistook for a comet. <laughs> um, but still, right, this description shows us just what some of these celestial events would meant to people. So the story I want to tell you begins slightly after this. It begins at a time that we now call the scientific revolution, uh, when people began rethinking the nature of the cosmos and also the kind of science that was most appropriate to study it with. 
Um, and I want to tell you a story that invokes these celestial events in two ways. One, events like comets, eclipses, and the occasional supernova uh, were kind of inspirational events that moved people to the study of astronomy in the first place, some of the central figures in our story. Um, and two, these phenomena often forced them to rethink what that cosmos was like, what it meant uh, to, you know, to, to be in the celestial realm um, in this era. So I'm going to start with Copernicus, although he actually is more a precursor to the story I want to tell than a kind of central figure in it, uh, for all that he did reshape astronomy by arguing as a kind of serious scientific position for the first time ever that perhaps the sun was at the center of the solar system and the Earth moved around it rather than the reverse. Um, he made this argument on the basis of few new observations of his own. He mostly reinterpreted the existing astronomical record. Um, and he argued that his system was more beautiful and more simple and more harmonious than the previous one. In other words, it was more awe-inspiring than the cosmological systems that people had believed in prior to this. Um, Ptolemy's system, in his perspective, was monstrous, as the word he used, because it required separate models for each planet that were kind of cobbled together. So Copernicus said, that's a monster, not a man. Um, Copernicus never saw a total solar eclipse, so we are much luckier than he. Uh, he never reported seeing a comet either, although he was sure never to miss a lunar eclipse. He observed these regularly. These were actually really important for astronomy because they allowed you to pinpoint the exact position of the moon, which was really important for pinpointing the positions of other celestial objects. And this is what he said about that. Um, in this area, and here he's talking about lunar eclipses, nature's kindliness has been attentive to human desires inasmuch as the moon's place is determined more reliably through its eclipses than through the use of instruments and without any suspicion of error. So he was really careful to record each and every lunar eclipse he saw. He marked them down in this book. This is a copy of Johannes Stoffler's uh, Calendarium Romanum Magnum. He marked down all the eclipses he saw, I think, between 1530 and 1541. And we actually have his eclipse observations in this book preserved today. You can go see it in Uppsala. So Copernicus is uh, significant for us by setting the stage for a lot of different questions about what the cosmos was like. Because if you remember, according to Aristotle, the cosmic realm is unchanging. It's perfect. It's utterly different from this earthly realm of change that we experience every day. Well, if the Earth is a planet just like the others, right, if it's part of that celestial realm, that means we need to rethink what we mean, not just about where we are, but also about the nature of the cosmos in general, right? What kind of new physics will uphold this region, this, this world, if we can't rely on this distinction between celestial and terrestrial. So he raised these questions. He didn't answer them. And it would be up to his successors to flesh them out, answer them, and only actually much later to prove them. And comets and eclipses are a big part of this story. So to start answering those questions, I'm going to move to our next figure in the story. Um, and this is Tycho Brahe. You might have heard of him, famous, colorful Danish nobleman. He uh, got into a duel as a young man where he lost his nose um, and had it replaced with a prosthetic nose made of gold and silver. He was sometimes referred to as the man with the silver tongue and the gold nose. He also famously had a pet moose which lived with him in his castle and would get drunk periodically at parties alongside him. Lots of good stories about this guy. Uh, but astronomy was never in the cards for him. So he was a nobleman. His parents intended him for more elite pursuits. And all this changed in 1559. He was 13 years old, and he witnessed a solar eclipse. Now, in parts of Europe, that solar eclipse was total. In Copenhagen, where he was, it would have been partial. But he was literally starstruck. That, that changed his life. He began buying astronomy books secretly, taking notes about them, deciding that this is maybe what he wanted to do with the rest of his life, uh, building astronomical instruments, perfecting them. He, in fact, became the greatest naked eye, one of the greatest naked eye astronomers um, to ever live um, after this. So he's working on astronomy. He's thinking about pursuing it. And um, when he's 25 years old, in 1572, he looks up and sees something pretty amazing in the sky. Let me show it to you here. It's a new star. It's really bright, so bright that you can see it by day for two weeks, and you can see it by night for a couple of years. Um, 
Tycho has at this point decided he knows every star in the heavens. He's learned them all by heart, and this is not one of them. It's totally new. He, in fact, describes it as the greatest wonder that has ever shown itself in the whole of nature since the beginning of the world. Um, and in, he conducts a series of observations on it and realizes that it shows no visible signs of parallax, which means that it's really far away. It's, in fact, certainly not you know, under the realm of the moon, but seems to be even farther away than the planets. It's what we would call today a supernova, by the way. Um, so this forces him to begin questioning that traditional Aristotelian cosmological picture that I mentioned, right? If there's no change in the heavens, I mean, what's a new star suddenly doing showing up there, right? Doesn't make sense. Um, so Tycho publishes a book about it, starts raising these questions, starts to build a reputation as a famous astronomer. Um, and there are worries in Denmark that he will be stolen by the Germans who want, you know, to be the sort of place where astronomers go. So the king of Denmark, in an effort to keep him local, offers him the gift of an island for himself, where he can build an observatory and study astronomy to his heart's delight. This is the island of Haven. And he builds a castle there with an observatory called Uraniburg. So here is an image of Tycho. He is uh, sitting in that throne-like chair on the right. Um, there's a sort of, um, you know, built-in astronomical device in the wall that you can use to pinpoint celestial positions. There was also a printing press in his castle. You can kind of see it on the middle row there. Um, there, by the way, he printed his eclipse observations and predictions, among other books. Um, and Tycho begins to study astronomy on this island. And it's five years later, when he's 30 years old, that he sees another new star in the sky. Um, show you uh, his pictures of it here. Um, as he's looking at it, he realizes that it has sort of rays behind it streaking through the sky. And he decides that it's a comet. And it's, in fact, the first comet he's ever seen in his life. Um, so he's also stunned by it. He points it out to everybody around him, continues to study it. And he realizes two things. One, it also must be very far away farther away, certainly, than Aristotle's suggestion that comets were terrestrial meteorological phenomena. It had to be celestial, which also questioned this celestial-terrestrial dichotomy. And two, when he reconstructed its orbital path, he realized that it crossed through the orbital paths of some of the planets. Now, this is a problem for the traditional world picture, because not only is the celestial realm perfect and unchanging, but what makes the planets move are these solid crystalline spheres that they're embedded in. If a comet can cross the path of these spheres, maybe they're not as solid as we thought. In fact, maybe they're not real at all. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, the eclipse that forces Tycho to begin thinking about astronomical questions. It's the supernova that makes him think maybe the old worldview is wrong. And it's the comet that really pushes him in the direction of we need a new world picture. He does, in fact, suggest his own. He is not willing to accept Copernicus's system, which has everything moving around the sun. He comes up with a hybrid option, which you can kind of see here. Let's see if I can show you. So is this one? Is this point pointing or not? No. This is the uh, Earth and the Sun. So what you can see there is that all the planets are moving around the Sun, but the Sun is moving around the Earth with all the planets. This comes to be known as the geoheliocentric or Tychonic system, which is actually a really important one because it's one that moves people part of the way toward heliocentrism. This is one that more people are willing to accept sooner than they're willing to accept a full-fledged move to a sun-centered system. So what I wanted to show you here is just how much these astronomical phenomena are part of the story. Now, the comet, let me just move to the next picture. So this is the comet of 1577 that uh, Tycho saw from his island in Haven. This is actually the same comet that inspired somebody else who's really important in the history of astronomy to pursue astronomy in the first place, and that's Johannes Kepler. So Kepler later in life recalled the moment when he's six years old as a child and he's asleep in bed that his mother shakes him awake and pulls him by the hand up a hill in his uh, hometown of Leonberg and points at the sky at a comet that um, she thinks he'd really want to see. And he recalled that moment um, 
with great passion later in life because that's what set him on the course that he would follow. Um, Galileo was about 13 at the time, so he probably saw the comet too, although he didn't record it in writing. Um, neither of them ever recorded seeing a total solar eclipse, and I don't think they did, although there was one that marked the year of Kepler's birth. 1572, uh, recorded here as a painting shortly afterwards, although set back in time, but this is the total solar eclipse of 1572. So um, both of these men would change the course of the history of astronomy, um, and they would do so in ways that were particularly centered on new, unusual, or previously unseen celestial phenomena. So I want to tell you that story briefly as sort of the second moment in our astronomy and awe journey. Um, so here's Galileo. Galileo famously turned his newly invented telescope to the heavens and spotted four previously unseen objects orbiting around Jupiter, which he later identified as moons. In fact, he named them the Medicean stars after his Florentine patrons, the Medici. But he also turned his telescope to the moon, um, and he revealed what he saw in drawings like these. And what he revealed is that the surface of the moon, in fact, looks really similar to the surface of the Earth. It has craters, it has mountains, right? So like some of the people we've seen before, it's not that different from the Earth. It's in fact quite similar. When he described seeing this later, this is what he says, in truth, it is a sight of the greatest wonder, right? So to being able to see the moon as another Earth was really awe-inspiring to him. He also turned his telescope to the sun I'll show you that here. Um, and he revealed other previously unseen phenomena, like spots on the surface of the sun, which we, you will see if you look over at our, at our uh, collection back there. We have a first edition copy of the book in which Galileo published his sunspot observations. To see these, uh, it's a myth that he looked at these and went blind. He did lose his sight later in life, but probably not because of staring at the sun. It didn't happen until much later. And in fact, he was very careful in terms of how he looked at the sun. So he was careful to either observe the sun very close to sunrise or very close to sunset, but also um, used a kind of camera obscura-like device um, suggested by his student, Benedetto Castelli, which is very similar to the types of devices that people in you know, years and centuries following would use to watch a total solar eclipse. Um, so here is um, a later depiction of that device by Jesuit astronomer Christoph Scheiner. Um, it essentially involved inverting a telescope lens and then projecting an image of the sun onto a paper, um, which would serve as both a screen and a kind of drawing board where you could draw what you would see. Um, if you didn't have access to a telescope lens in order to look at the sun and you wanted to look at that, the sun, say during a solar eclipse or some other event, um, Galileo had advice for you. Um, he says, when in a church you see the light of the sun fall on the floor, hasten there with a large unfolded sheet of white paper because you will discern spots on it. Now, he may here have been referring to something like this, because some churches of the era were built with what were called gnomon holes, or you know, deliberate holes built into their facade that would turn them essentially into giant astronomical devices or giant cameras obscura. They would project an image of the sun onto the floor of the uh, church. There would be meridian lines of, on the floor of the church, and you could chart the shape and position of the sun over time, uh, which was important not just for astronomical observations, but also so you could better decide the date of Easter. Um, so, um, <laughs> yes, and you can visit this. This is Santa Maria Novella in Florence. You can visit it today and still see these uh, gnomon holes. Uh, so, um, Galileo and Kepler both intersected at many points throughout their life, specifically over the telescope, but they intersected over comets again uh, in 1618, because in 1618, three comets appeared in quick succession. Uh, the last was unusually large and brilliant, and it was visible from November until January of 1619. Uh, the young John Milton, who was 10 at the time, may well have seen these comets too. We don't know if he did, but if he didn't, he certainly read about them in the many, many tracts that were published about them, predicting all kinds of doom or political upheaval and change. And in fact, Milton incorporated this comet into Paradise Lost. Let me show you. Um, 
he depicted Satan <laughs> as this comet. So he writes, incensed with indignation, Satan stood, unterrified and like a comet burned, that fires the length of Ophiuchus huge in the Arctic sky, and from his horrid hair shakes pestilence and war. So you can see the image of the comet in here. There's actually a conflation of two astronomical events here because this is the comet of 1618 he's probably talking about. In 1604, there's a supernova in the constellation Ophiuchus that also has lots of people writing about it. And Milton kind of merges them together here. But you can at least see the way that comets are really important and you know palpable to people at the time and that they were still real portents of doom even in the 17th century. There was also still real debate about what they were. So I just, as one example, want to show you this frontispiece. This is a late 17th century frontispiece, so 1668, um, by Johannes Avelius about comets. And what he's showing us on the cover are three people debating what comets are. The one on the left is supposed to be Aristotle, and he's still showing them as meteorological, supralunar, right, earthly phenomena. The one on the right is supposed to be Kepler, who is showing us comets moving in straight lines. Kepler saw them as um, something sort of extra soul. They're outside of our solar system, and they move in straight lines, and you never see them again. Um, and Hevelius in the middle, who's arguing that maybe they have some kind of circular motion. It's not clear, but they're debating this. Right? This is after the story I want to tell you, but just to show you that you know this is a matter that's highly debated. So when the comets appear, um, Galileo gets embroiled in a debate about them. Um, on one side of the debate um, is a Jesuit, Horatio Grazzi, who argues that comets are far off distant objects that um, are maybe like planets that have unusual motions. Um, and Galileo does not believe this. He thinks that comets might not be real at all. They might be reflections of sunlight in the atmosphere. Maybe they look far away, but that's just because they're opposite optical illusions. Uh, Kepler intervenes in this debate to say, no, I think they're real. I think they move in straight lines. And by the way, they might still be portents of doom also. <laughs> so I think this story is significant for a few reasons. First, it shows us that great figures in the history of science can sometimes be wrong, <laughs> as Galileo was here. And in fact, not only here, Galileo also believed, as just one interesting example, that the tides are caused by the motion of the Earth, right? The waters kind of slosh around as the Earth moves through space. In fact, he believed this so strongly that he thought it was the proof of his heliocentric system, even though he was wrong about that. Um, so you can be right and wrong at the same time. It's also important just because the comet dispute leads Galileo to publish a final book, sort of his, you know, his final page in the story, which is this book, The Assayer of 1623. So in the Assayer, Galileo talks about his position on comets. He says what he thinks they are. He says, again, they're not real, they're just optical illusions. He also very famously puts forth his philosophy of science in this book. It's the place where he argues, if you've ever heard the quote, that nature is written in the language of mathematics and its characters are triangles and circles and squares without which you can't understand it at all. He dedicates the book to Cardinal Maffeo Barberini, who is soon to become Pope Urban VIII, and the Pope loves it. He loves the book. He loves it so much that he apparently had parts of it read out loud to him at dinner time. And it's the positive reception of this book on comets that encourages Galileo to publish a much more controversial book, his dialogue on the two great world systems, which kicks off his trial and ultimate condemnation. So comets are part of that story too. Okay, moving on, because we don't have as much time as I would like, <laughs> I want to tell you about another uh, important figure in our story who, as a schoolboy in the late 1650s, played a practical joke on his neighbors in Lincolnshire when he uh, built a lantern out of paper and put a candle inside it and attached it to a kite and ran with the kite in the middle of the night so that his neighbors were convinced that there was a comet <laughs> around and were terrified. And maybe you can guess who I'm talking about. It's this guy, Isaac Newton. <laughs> who uh, developed a lifelong fascination with comets. Um, in fact, he reports that as a young student at Cambridge, I think in 1664, he spent so much time observing the comet that was then visible that he lost sleep and his words was much disheveled. Um, he also kept track of his observations of the comet of the next year in writing. Uh, it was something he focused on throughout his life. 
Um, and there were a, a series of comets that were particularly important to him. So these were, this was uh, the comet of 1680 shown here in two separate depictions. This is the first comet discovered by telescope. Um, it has an astonishingly long tail. Uh, there are s hordes of publications. People are awed by the sight. England is flooded with ominous predictions about what it might mean. So when this comet appears, Newton is already pretty famous. He's conducted his prison experiments. He's worked out his early system of calculus. He's been appointed the location chair of mathematics at Trinity College, Cambridge. He observes the comet really carefully. He corresponds with other people about it and is trying to figure out what he can say about it. Or maybe I should say what he could say about them, um, because the comet appears twice, uh, once in November and again in December. And most people are convinced that what they're looking at is two separate comets. Um, Newton corresponds with John Flamsteed, who's the Astronomer Royal, um, who says, I think actually it may be one comet that came back. And Newton does not believe this is possibly true at this point. He has already worked out a version of his theory of gravity. He's applied it to the planets. He doesn't think it applies to comets. Comets, he thinks, move differently than planets do. And he thinks at this moment in time, they probably move in straight lines like Kepler thought before him. Uh, so he is trying to work out the orbit of this comet, assuming rectilinear motion, and he just can't do it. Um, he writes to Edmund Halley, a fellow astronomer who will later have a comet named after after him, and he finds that Halley is incapable of doing it either. The math just won't work. Um, so it's in correspondence with Flamseed and Halley as Newton struggles over this comet um, that he comes to A, realize that probably he's wrong and Flamsteed is right, and that it's not two comets, but one comet that's curving really sharply around the sun and coming back but also that maybe this theory of gravity he's working out is more universal than he thought. Maybe it actually applies to all objects in the universe equally. So this is a really important piece to the puzzle for Newton, um, which he publishes first as a short work called On Motion, where he talks about the motion of the comets and other objects, is then convinced to publish it as a larger book, uh, which eventually becomes his magnum opus, The Principles of Natural Philosophy, or the Principia, uh, which includes this image of a comet in it and Newton's description of its orbital motion and the ways in which it falls under his theory of gravitation. He writes, this discussion about comets is the most difficult in the whole book. But it's also the most important in a sense because it's the kind of proof that the theory of gravitation is truly universal. So this is not the only reason comets were important for Newton. Newton is engaged in lots of different debates and disputes over his life. You probably know about the uh, debate with his rival on the continent, Gottfried William Leibniz, where they're disputing you know, who invented calculus. The two also were engaged in a lengthy dispute about the nature of space and time and God. Uh, Leibniz believed that force in the universe was conserved overall, and Newton believed that it was not. So Newton believed that the universe was sort of gradually losing force and that stars were gradually dissipating um, and might under other circumstances disappear entirely. Leibniz accused him of, you know, depicting a god who was imperfect, who couldn't create a perfect universe from the get-go. Newton, through his follower Clark, accused Leibniz of imagining a god who had created a universe so perfect that he was utterly absent from it. It didn't need him at all. So from Newton's perspective, the universe was winding down and needed to somehow be refilled. How could this be accomplished? His answer was comets. So here's what he says. So the first is about stars, what, what, what refills stars. Fix stars that have been gradually wasted by the light and vapors emitted from them for a long time may be recruited by comets that fall upon them. And from this fresh supply of new fuel, those old stars acquiring new splendor may pass for new stars. He says something similar about the Earth, too. What he says later is, the vapors which arise from the sun, the fixed stars, and the tails of comets may meet at last with and fall into the atmosphere of planets by their gravity, and there be condensed and turned into water and humid spirits, and from thence by slow heat pass gradually into the form of salts and sulfurs and tinctures and mud and clay and sand and stones and coral and other terrestrial substances. So in a certain sense for Newton, comets are actually the life force of the universe itself, which is pretty cool to think about. And not maybe that far distant from some of the ways in which we think about um, the universe generating itself. So 
One last, oh, I should say, before I get to the last quote of the story, I want to note that um, Newton and his follower Edmund Halley both also thought that if, the, if comets were responsible for the Earth's continued generation, they might also be responsible for its eventual destruction, either by a comet hitting the Earth or a comet falling into the sun and destroying the Earth, which are possibilities that um, Halley specifically mentioned. Halley, in fact, also thought that a lot of the catastrophes described in the Old Testament might be explained through comets. So for example, he uh, played with the theory that maybe Noah's flood was caused by a comet hitting the Earth and abruptly tilting the axis of the Earth, causing flooding everywhere. He was forced to revise this theory when somebody asked him how Noah's Ark could have possibly survived that. And he thought, OK, maybe that wasn't the best example for that, you know, that explanation. Uh, but he did think that the eventual destruction of the Earth might be caused by a comet, in fact, by the comet of 1680, which didn't hit the Earth then, but came really close and might on its next pass. Uh, what he said was, may the great God avert a shock or contact of such great bodies moving with such forces, lest this most beautiful order of things be entirely destroyed and reduced to its ancient chaos. So for Halley, this was far off in the future because he predicted, he calculated that this comet had a uh, period of about 575 years, which would be about 200 years in the future for us. So there's time yet. Um, last thing I want to note is that the comet of 1682 is the one that became known as Halley's Comet. Um, and it's one that he studied for a while. Here is a note um, that he writes to Newton saying, I think this is a comet we've seen a couple of times since 1531. Could you write to Flamsteed and let, let him you know, tell you what he knows about it? Because I don't think he's going to tell me, but I think he's going to tell you. Um, and what Halley did was he worked out the details of that comet's orbit using Newtonian theory and predicted that it would return in the year 16, 1758, which would be after both Halley and Newton were dead. But um, although you know Newtonian theory was already widely accepted and celebrated, uh, was seen to be a potential final test for sort of the predictive capacity of Newtonian theory. Right? If that comet came back that year in 1758, then Newton could surely predict anything. So as before total solar eclipses, there were you know publications charting the path of that comet, and there were people who went out waiting to see it. Um, and it did. It returned. This was seen as a triumph of Newton's theory. Um, it vindicated what Alexander Pope had said when Newton died. Nature and nature's laws lay hid in night. God said, let Newton be, and all was light. Right? There was this vision that Newton was almost a godlike figure who could you know, explain everything there was to know about heavens and earth. And in fact, all people in all kinds of disciplines, not just astronomy, but other sciences, and not just other sciences, but politics even, tried to come up with laws that were universal and true for everyone, like Newton had done. Uh, of course, there's always a but, <laughs> and that but comes later in the story, um, as you can see by this epigram written in 1916 in response to Pope's. It did not last. The devil howling ho, let Einstein be, restored the status quo. <laughs> so that's the story I want to turn to last, the story of how Einstein's notion of general relativity unseated Newton's notion of gravity. And that's a story that's also about a famous astronomical event, in that case, a total solar eclipse. So I'm going to turn to that. Uh, but I actually want to start not with Einstein, but with this guy. Arthur Eddington, who uh, was a brilliant mathematician, apparently um, at a young age, I think at the age of three, he learned the 24 by 24 multiplication tables before he could read. Um, he was fascinated by total solar eclipses. He supposedly wrote an essay as a young age in which he talked about the many great astronomers who would make expeditions to solar eclipses, see solar eclipses in the future, probably because there were ones already happening. I mean, he was born uh, not pretty close to the story of the 1878 eclipse that David Barron told uh, last night. Um, so he uh, is appointed head of the observatory in Cambridge um, in 1913, which is around the time that Albert Einstein is working out his theory of general relativity. There's a story, by the way, where um, Eddington is at a meeting and somebody says to him, you're probably one of only three people in the world who understands relativity. And Eddington gets kind of quiet and looks puzzled. And the person says to him, now don't be modest. And he says, no, no, you misunderstand. I'm trying to figure out who the third one is. <laughs> 
so he, Einstein's theory um, argues that um, space time essentially massive objects will curve space time, right? So the, as an example, um, if starlight comes really close to the sun, the mass of the sun should deflect the path of the starlight. Um, and what you would see then is the uh, change in apparent position of a star really close to the sun as predicted by Einstein's theory. So the problem is, right, you don't usually see, you can't see stars near the sun, the sun blocks the, you know, our sight of the stars during daytime, but it was understood fairly early on that one way to test Einstein's theory would be to look at the sun, look at stars near it during a total solar eclipse. Um, and in fact, there were uh, expeditions that were conducted as early as 1912 to test this possibility. The one in 1912 failed uh, because it was too rainy. Um, there was an expedition undertaken by a group of German scientists in 1914 uh, where they traveled to Russia to observe a total solar eclipse about to happen there. But maybe you can guess what happens when a group of German scientists arrive in Russia in 1914, just as World War I is breaking out. <laughs> they are promptly arrested as enemy spies. Uh, their equipment confiscated as enemy surveillance equipment. This is actually not the first time that this has happened in the history of astronomy. I could tell you stories about astronomers over the course of time who are arrested because people thought they must be spies. Uh, in this case, they have to wait a few weeks to be released as part of a prisoner exchange, and they don't get their equipment back for years. Um, but this is actually really good for Einstein because in 1915, he's continuing, he's continuing to revise his theory of relativity and he realizes that the deflection he had initially predicted was wrong. It should be double that, if I'm remembering right. Um, which means that if people had actually observed the deflection of starlight during a total solar eclipse earlier, they would have found a result that was different than what Einstein had predicted, and his theory might have been discarded, at least temporarily. But they didn't, so we have the new uh, predicted amount. Um, and people are continually thinking, how can I test this? There's another attempted expedition in 1918 that fails. Um, but at, at this point, Eddington, um, and his friend Frank Dyson, astronomer royal at the time, have their sights set on a particular total solar eclipse in May of 1919. Um, it's going to be a good one. It's supposed to be really long, about six minutes, one of the longest of the 20th century. Um, it's supposed to pass near a bright cluster of background stars, so it appears really promising. Uh, the problem is that in 1918, World War I is still ongoing, and the Brits are losing lots and lots of men to the war effort. And they're getting really reluctant to give people exemptions, particularly occupation-based exemptions. And just as Eddington is planning this expedition, his occupation-based exemption is revoked. And he's, he's 35 years old, he's single, he's told he has to go fight. Um, he's very upset about this, not just because of the, the eclipse, but also because he's a Quaker. Um, he's a conscious, conscientious objector to the war in general. What he actually says when he hears this is this, my objection to war is based on religious grounds. I cannot believe that God is calling me to go out and slaughter men, many of whom are animated by the same motives of patriotism and supposed religious duty that have sent my countrymen into the field. Uh, but he knows that this might not sway the military tribunal who has to decide his, whether his exemption should last. So he asks for letters from his colleagues also. Frank Dyson is very smart and knows how to appeal to a group of patriotic Brits who are trying to decide these things. So what he writes is this. Eddington studies maintain the high tradition of British science at a time when it is very desirable that it should be upheld, particularly in view of a widespread but erroneous notion that the most important scientific researches are carried out in Germany. <laughs> this appeal is successful. <laughs> And Eddington is granted a 12-month exemption to uh, pursue his eclipse studies and hopefully find something important. Um, so there's a lot of effort that goes into planning this expedition. There are actually two crews that are sent out, one to Brazil and one to an island off the coast of Africa, which Eddington goes to. He describes it as the trip of a lifetime, although he says that when the actual eclipse happens, he doesn't really see it, right? This is the trouble with being an astronomer is that you're so busy working, you don't always have time to look at what you're supposed to be seeing. He says he only saw it a couple of times, once to make sure it was there and once to check on it again. <laughs> Otherwise, he took lots and lots of photographs and hoped that one of them would show what he needed to show. Uh, here's one of them, by the way, one of the pictures taken from that eclipse. Hopefully we should see something like that too. Um, 
he spent months afterward assessing the photographs and seeing if they showed proof of the uh, deflection that Einstein had predicted, and ultimately concluded that they did. Um, and he presented his data at a November meeting, um, in, so six months later. This is a record of the uh, book of the Cambridge Club for the meeting where he presented his data. And this is the poem he read out loud at the time. This seems to be a tradition, right? Um, oh, leave the wise are measures to collate. One thing is certain, at least is certain, light has weight. One thing is certain and the rest debate. Light rays when near the sun do not go straight. <laughs> So this is reported throughout the press around the world. I'm sure here's some of the press coverage. Eclipse showed gra uh, gravity variation, hailed as epic making, greatest discovery in history, lights all askew in the heavens, men of science more or less agog over results of eclipse. Einstein is pretty well known at this time, especially in Germany, but this is what makes him an international celebrity. Um, although anecdotally, and I, I can't verify that this that actually happened, but the story is that when somebody approaches Einstein and says, what would have happened had the eclipse, eclipse expedition failed? Um, he says, then I would feel sorry for the dear Lord. The theory is right. <laughs> Um, but in fact, it was successful. Um, interestingly, although this is hailed as proof of Einstein's theory in the press and among the general public right away, among astronomers, there's a deep debate about what this prediction actually proves, whether it's done well, whether they you know, were clear about the variables. And so there are a lot of repeat eclipse um, observations and expeditions to test this exact same thing over the years. It's not until the 1960s that the entire astronomical community agrees this is definitely what this experiment showed. Einstein's prediction was right. So to begin concluding, <laughs> what I hope I've shown so far over the course of this talk is that awe-inspiring astronomical phenomena have affected the course of the history of astronomy in a couple of ways. First, they've inspired some of our key players to pursue astronomy in the first place. Um, and second, they've changed the way in which we understand astronomy, science, the cosmos in general. So I think we should be really excited about the eclipse of, that's coming up on April 8th. Um, and also think about you know, who might be watching that eclipse, whether somebody right, like Tycho with his partial solar eclipse or Kepler with his comet or Newton with his comets, right, might, because of it, be inspired to study science, might change the way we think about the world. Um, so I have a coda, a brief coda, which is that um, when I was thinking about this talk, I went to the library here and I went up to our eclipse shelf um, and I began browsing the eclipse books just to see what we had. And I stumbled on this one. How much time do I have? Am, am I I'm OK? All right. I stumbled on this one. So this is um, Mary Loomis Todd. And if you were at the talk last night that David Barron gave, she was one of the people who, in answer to the question, what do you regret leaving out? He mentioned her and her husband, David Todd. Um, da Mary Loomis Todd is most famous for um, Publish, editing and publishing Emily Dickinson's poems. Her husband was an astronomer. Um, she went with him on astronomical ex, uh, ob, you know, expeditions. She published, she co-authored um, an astronomy textbook with him. And she went to observe lots of total solar eclipses with him. I think she visited you know, 30 countries on five continents with him to watch total solar eclipses. And she writes about them in this book that I found, Total Eclipses of the Sun, which is one of the books we have back there too. So you can take a look at it. It's actually a really great read. But um, what I wanted to tell you, to read to you guys actually, because it's, it's that good, is her description of the experience of a total solar eclipse. So let me find that here. Um, the book is written, by the way, in 1894. So here is Mary Loomis Todd's description of the experience of a total solar eclipse. With frightful velocity, the actual shadow of the moon is often seen approaching, a tangible darkness advancing almost like a wall, swift as imagination, silent as doom. The immensity of nature never comes quite so near as then, and strong must be the nerves not to quiver as this blue-black shadow rushes upon the spectator with incredible speed. A vast, palpable presence seems overwhelming the world. The blue sky changes to gray or dull purple, speedily becoming dusky, and a death-like trance seizes upon everything earthly. Birds with terrified cries fly bewildered for a moment, then silently seek their night quarters. 
Bats emerge stealthily. Sensitive flowers, the scarlet pimpernel, the African mimosa, close their delicate petals, and a sense of hushed expectancy deepens with the darkness. An assembled crowd is awed into absolute silence almost invariably. Trivial chatter and senseless joking cease. Sometimes the shadow engulfs the observer smoothly, sometimes apparently with jerks, but all the world might well be dead and cold and turned to ashes. Often the very air seems to hold its breath for sympathy. At other times a lull suddenly awakens into a strange wind blowing with unnatural light. Then, out upon the darkness, gruesome but sublime, flashes the glory of the incomparable corona, a silvery, soft, unearthly light with radiant streamers stretching at times millions of uncomprehended miles into space, while the rosy flaming perturbances skirt the black rim of the moon in ethereal splendor. It becomes curiously cold, due frequently forms, and the chill is perhaps mental as well as physical. Suddenly, Instantaneous as a flash, an actual arrow of sunlight strikes the landscape, and the earth comes to life again, while corona and perturbances melt into returning brilliance, and occasionally the receding lunar shadow is glimpsed as it flies away with the tremendous speed of its approach. I doubt, and this is still her, if the effect of witnessing a total eclipse ever quite passes away. The impression is singularly vivid and quieting for days and can never wholly be lost. A startling nearness to the gigantic forces of nature and their inconceivable operation seems to have been established. Personalities and towns and cities and hates and jealousies grow very small and very far away. So my hope for us these days, when we could all certainly use a moment in which hates and jealousies fade away in the face of the vastness of nature, is that this eclipse that we're about to witness be not a portent of doom, as it sometimes was, but of hope for all of us. Thank you. Yes, I will say we have time for uh, brief questions or brief comments. And so we just want to keep that in mind. Where will you be watching mm. the eclipse? Good question. And the answer is, I will be right here. So we're having an eclipse panel um, on campus. Um, and afterward, you know, different faculty members will speak about the eclipse. But then afterwards, we're all gathering right out on the lawn over here. There will be student performances, I'm told. Um, and eclipse glasses handed out. And I'll be watching it here, to, you know, hopefully with some of you. Okay. Any other questions? Where can we find that great quote by Mary Lewis? Uh, so I could send it to you if you email me, but um, we do have her, you can check out her book from the Kelvin Smith Library also. It actually is a really good read, um, and you can take a look at it back there too. But I'm very happy to email it to you also. You made a mention at the very beginning about um, how astronomy uh, was not seen as a respectable profession, that the Danish um, astronomer was encouraged not to go in. I was just wondering if you could say a little bit about that, about why that was at that time. Oh, that's a, it's a multi-part answer. I mean, first of all, astronomy is not it's not science in the way we think of science back then. So astro science is kind of natural philosophy. It's a form of philosophy in which you can think about nature and what it's like. And astronomy back then is seen as a kind of calculational tool. It lets you come up with models that will show you how the planets move, but not what they're like, because that's what the philosophers talk about, but that's not what the astronomers talk about. So even in the hierarchy of the sciences, it's lower down. Um, but uh, the pursuit of science itself Self, you know, among the nobility back then is not the best thing you could do with your time. <laughs> so, so from both perspectives, his parents hoped he would go into politics or something like that. Is Tycho's observatory and castle still operating? Is it still open? Oh, I know that his none of his instruments are there. I'm not sure. Does, it, does anybody has anybody been to Havana and know if what's still? I don't know what's still there actually. Alan, do you know? There, but I do know that they tried to open a, a, a Pico Brahe sort of park with 
Yes, yeah, so, so not much is still there, although if you want to see Tico Brahe's instruments, strangely, where you can find them is China. Because when uh, Jesuit scientists went to China to try to spread the gospel of science, one of the first things they did is bring Tico's books with them and recreate some of his astronomical instruments. So there are 17th century versions of Tico's instruments still in China, although we don't have um, you know, 17th century versions of his instruments here. Oh, so some so to answer the second part first, what some of them did was use devices like what I showed you, right? The devices that let you look indirectly at the sun. I don't know when eclipse glasses specifically became a thing, although I do know um, David Barron in his talk yesterday, so this, that's the eclipse of 1878, um, had images of people uh, holding up colored glass. So not eclipse glasses, but like glass you could look through to see um, the eclipse. Although I don't know precisely when that first became a thing. So I hope you all have a chance to look at the wonderful books back there and you'll recognize some from my talk. Um, and I'll still be around to answer questions if anybody has any others. Thank you so much.